Now continuing in Matthew chapter 5, pick up at verse 17, where Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, this statement pretty much embodies everything that he's about to say for quite some time to come. In fact, he discusses the comparison of himself, his relationship, in fact, to the Old Testament law through about verse 30. And then he begins to discuss, beginning in verse 31, he begins discussing the issue of divorce as a matter of the law. What the Lord is doing through this entire discourse here is he's actually demonstrating how important love is. He's demonstrating that love is at the core of all that we think and all that we do and how we behave and where our faith stands. We're told in Scripture that we love him because he first loved us. It's his love that brought him to earth from his heavenly place to sacrifice himself as the sacrificial lamb on our behalf. He didn't do all that so he could then come to the earth and simply destroy all that there is. Instead of destroying, he said, I have come to fulfill. And if we look at the focus here, that's exactly what we have taking place throughout the entirety of the Gospel of Matthew. We have Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures promising the Messiah, promising the Anointed One, promising the Christ. So as we continue, verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, the terms jot and tittle, you may have heard this before, they are very small markings in the Hebrew alphabet. And what Jesus is simply saying here is every last little prophecy, every last little element of the law will be fulfilled. And the only way that law is going to be fulfilled is not simply by him, but in him. He will be the only sinless man and has been since that time the only sinless man ever to walk the earth. The law can't be fulfilled in any other man because the moment we break even the least little tiny iota of the law, the least little jot or tittle of the law, at that point we've broken the entire law. So it can't be fulfilled in us the very first time that we fall short. Verse 19, whosoever therefore shall break one of these, and this is the explanation right here, shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, there's a double-edged sword in verse 19, and it, and it involves understanding a little bit of the history of the law under the Hebrew nations. There came a time during the period known as the intertestamental period, that 400 years between the final writings of the Old Testament and the closing of those books and the opening of the time period covered in the Gospels, which begins with the birth of Christ and the, the period immediately surrounding that historically. And in that time period, the Sanhedrin had gotten together and they had discussed, basically what they had done is they had this big council and they revamped everything that was known and that was understood about the law. And they realized, logically, that the law could never actually be kept by an individual. So they took a step back and they said, well, let's not look at the law as a matter of something that must be kept specifically. Let's look at the law, rather, as something that has an intent. And if we can keep the intent of the law, that is, if we can keep the heart or the spirit of the law, then we should be able to have been said to actually keep the entire law. Now, remember, there's nothing in Old Testament teaching that supports this. There's nothing in Old Testament teaching that says if a man breaks the law, 
or if a man keeps the law in a manner that is different but is remolded so that a person can fit the law and that a person can then keep those ordinances, there's nothing in the Old Testament that says that this is okay. There's nothing in the Old Testament that says this is what God accepts. No, God says these are the laws, and those that break these laws are worthy of X, Y, and Z judgments and punishments up to and including death. Another thing you want to focus on, too, is many of the promises in the Old Testament concerning the Lord's relationship with his people Israel were earthly promises. In other words, there were promises of long age and prosperity that actually reflected people having literally long age, many years literally having prosperity, as in having physical wealth or physical power or influence and so forth. Those Old Testament promises are not different from the New Testament promises, but what they are is they are earthly manifestations of what's taking place in heaven. In the New Testament, we recognize that these promises now are fulfilled in Christ, so we don't need to look for earthly promises to be fulfilled. When we run around saying that if we follow Jesus Christ, we're going to be rich, or if we follow Jesus Christ, we're going to come into a, a position of fame or power or high authority. If we follow Jesus Christ, we're going to live to be 110, these sorts of things. These are all misinterpretations, because now that law under which the Jew had been promised these earthly things has been fulfilled in Christ. Now make no mistake, the faithful Hebrew of the Old Testament, the one who has come to God in faith believing, he receives the same reward as the New Testament saint who believes in Christ who has risen from the dead. Because in effect, that's exactly what the Old Testament saint was doing as well. He believes the same way, and he is rewarded the same way. The only thing is, in the Old Testament, Christ had not come in the flesh yet, so often the evidence was something material that could be substantiated. That doesn't mean that there were times that there were not material things, but many times there were. Example, the parting of the Red Sea, the falling down of the walls at Jericho, the great strength of Samson, the great bravery of David, the victory of Gideon. There are just many, many examples in the Old Testament of things that took place that were miraculous and supernatural, where God's hand was obviously intervening in a situation. Reading about the prophets Elijah and Elisha, quite a few miracles taking place there. Now, the prophets themselves didn't end up being wealthy or well-to-do, but they did have the power and the influence and the favor of God before mankind. And even when they met great resistance and were rejected, the Lord protected them and the Lord dealt with them kindly throughout. So that's a long explanation, but it's important to understand that because the Jew looking at this or hearing this word in verse 19 saying, who shall ever break the least one of these commandments? This issue really is foreign because they say, okay, I'm keeping it according to this new rabbinical order. And so because of that, I'm okay. I'm of the seed of Abraham. So if I follow the ordinances, I'm covered. 